before that, let me start with Dr. Rondelli. So splenectomy is used in myelofibrosis for symptomatic control. Is there any data to suggest if it has any impact on overall survival? There are a few retrospective studies that were done actually initially at the uh, Hutch uh, many years ago by Joaquin Deeg, uh, showing that there was no difference in the outcome of, of uh, patients with, with and without splenectomy. In the prospective studies in Germany, of the EBMT studies uh, of Kruger, uh, in univariate analysis, patients who went splenectomy prior to transplant <coughs> had a higher relapse rate after transplant. But this was not confirmed in multivariate analysis, and uh, I don't think there's a final answer to that. Uh, but definitely there's no show of, of, of advantage. Um, we published a paper years ago for patients with a very large spleen who did not undergo, with a spleen larger than 30 centimeters longitudinal size, uh, who underwent transplant without splenectomy, all of them had a reduced uh, spleen after the transplant, some of them completely reduced, some others 50% reduction. And the, the major issue is the engraftment. So the concern is that a patient with a big spleen may not engraft well because the spleen will sequester mm -hmm. the cells. But at this time, again, there's no proof that splenectomy is, is a, does it better. Can you help with turning the mic on, please? Yeah. Uh, the calreticular mutation that, that you talked about, uh, in the past, I've used that primarily in patients that I was unsure if it was primary polycythemia versus secondary polycythemia because there was a JAK2 mutation that was not found. But I suspected that they still had primary type. Uh, you're saying now that maybe we should be looking at this as a prognostic marker in Actually, all patients. So ET patients actually can have a carotidal uh, mutation too. It's not only myelofibrosis. So I showed that in ET patients actually has a good prognostic value uh, with less risk of thrombosis. Right. So I think that actually before, you know, the, the JAK2 mutation is found in about 50% of the patients with myelofibrosis and uh, ET. So there were remaining, remaining half of the patients that we, we did not know if they had any, any mutation. Now we have not only the carotidal mutation that accounts for probably uh, 30 to 40 percent of the non jak 2 is exclusive of the jak 2 mutation, but also the other mutation, the, the XL1, IDH1 and 2, and TAT2, all the others are all diagnostic. Uh, in the WHO classification are meant to be, are valuable as diagnostic criteria. Thank you. You also mentioned picritinib uh, as being a new drug that would be available for myelofibrosis. I know in the PERSIST trial that they put in a, a hold on the use of picritinib because of some complications, cardiovascular, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, has that been released now again? I believe so. We don't have it in our center, but I think it's been uh, released. Thank you. Another question I have is for high-risk essential thrombocytemia, so you said age and, risk, uh, and previous history of thrombosis being the main uh, risk factors. How about those patients who have acquired one Willy Brandt fa factor disease, one Willy Brandt disease? You like somebody no. with uh, 1.5 million platelet count and has easy bruising and bleeding tendency, would you consider that high risk ET? Um, well, so your question is would you give him aspirin? Um, chemotherapy. Oh, the, no, because aspirin, I would not give you aspirin. Um, so to control, I, I don't think that there is data to, to show that this patient would have, uh, would need uh, hydroxyurea. You're talking about, would you treat the, 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 the thrombocytemia with hydroxyurea to lower, would lower the cancer platelets, uh, decrease the risk of bleeding? Right. Um, I don't think there's any data to support that. I think that uh, um, I, I probably wouldn't unless the patient had s clearly worsened their risk of bleeding because the, 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 the clinical picture is looked at upon the, the time. So in, in, if by increasing the number of platelets actually the patient has higher risk, then I probably would. But I don't think that would be an indication right now. Okay. Um, now a question for Dr. Libby. So, daratumumab is uh, 
Pretty. Do you want to? Do you have questions? I have questions. Yeah. Go ahead. So, for Dr. Rondelli and Dr. Libby, both great talks. For Dr. Rondelli, <clears throat> lot of polycythemia consults come, and uh, besides Jack two, all the mutations you described are they? Reliably diagnosed on peripheral blur, they would all require bone minerals, for example. Because in community, a lot of people simply seem to be doing peripheral blood as a screening for these mutations. Is that acceptable, or would they all go to the marrows? We normally send it with the bone marrow. Okay. Yeah, I'd, yeah, the peripheral blood. Uh, actually, I, I don't, I don't have the the data on that, but I think most of the times it's are done on, on on bone marrow. On bone marrow. Uh, for Dr. Levy as well as Dr. Rondelli, two questions. Ideal time for stem cell harvest in a newly diagnosed myeloma. Right at diagnosis, first remission. The it depends. It it, it does vary from uh, center to center uh, a little bit. Um, generally, most centers, virtually all, want to see the patient within four to six cycles of induction therapy and then to make plans for collection. Our center likes to collect only if patients have a SPEP or an M spike less than one, and then when we do the collection marrow to see less than 10% uh, plasma cells in the marrow. Uh, but early really is the answer, three, within three to six cycles of induction therapy. Again, um, it, it's, I, think, I think it's very important to remember that even if uh, there is significant disease remaining, say 15% plasma cells, you're not going to cure the disease whether there's 1% or whether there's 15%. You're just giving more chemotherapy. Um, although there are studies, and we're looking at it ourselves, looking at the quality of the graph to see if, how it affects outcome. But that's been looked at before. And, uh, uh, but the answer is early is, is the time. And, and definitely something that transplant centers, I'm sure Dr. Rondelli Center struggles with this at times, is we'll see patients two years out. They've received a lot of chemotherapy, and it can make it much, much more challenging to collect. Um, of course, you should never give uh, particularly melphalan, the uh, stem cell injuring uh, drugs. And there is a, a concern about Revlimid inhibiting collection, but we can usually, most cases, we can overcome that by either using a chemotherapy-based collection, like, for instance, with cyclophosphamide. And there is a new drug, relatively new drug, called Mozabil that allows almost everyone to be collected in 2016. Long answer, I saw, I'm sorry. Good answer. I'm, I'm Mike Dunning in Utah. Um, Dr. Libby, uh, what, what, what do you do with patients with smoldering myeloma where you agonize over some findings that may indicate slow progression, like you know, light chains go a little bit up. You do um, PET scans, uh, maybe an MRI. There are some lesions that are kind of equivocal, um, so it's really difficult to tell whether it's slow progression. Do you have any... Um, recommendations as to how often you monitor the people, not to keep them in, in a permanent suspense and, you know, get into this worry cycle. And on the other hand, not to miss the time when it's really time to pull the trigger and, and, and move. You, you speak very quietly and, and beautifully, but I didn't, and I also have terrible hearing, but I think what you're asking, just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, how often would we follow these people and uh, that it's a challenge to have them sitting on the edge of their seat all the time? Correct. Okay. Well, and that's a great point. Um, I, for some reason, I find this topic of smoldering myeloma to be really interesting but, uh, for a number of reasons, but um, it opens up, this, this concept opens up a big can of worms. Um, now, it's, it, for instance, if you decide, well, I'm not going to use the MDEs in this patient right now to treat. I'm going to watch them closely for whatever reason. The patient doesn't want to be treated. You don't think they really need it quite yet. Um, well, then that, that question of how often do you follow and what do you follow with comes up. And of course, all the cost that's associated with that, um, the potential for false positives and false negatives, and, uh, and then the, the, the worry for the patient. 
Um, I think usually I would always follow these patients at least every other month, uh, every month to every other month, depending on their risks, which of those factors they have. The, I think the clearest data is in is people with 60 percent or more plasma cells. There's a spectacular short paper that was submitted by Kyle about that. But I would follow them very closely. I would tell them that I cannot guarantee, even if I see them every month, that in four weeks that something won't happen. They're not going to develop a pathological fracture in within four weeks if I got an MRI recently, but they could develop renal insufficiency, they could develop anemia or hypercalcemia. It's generally not going to happen, but it could. Um, in terms of imaging, I would image them, uh, I would, would often will alternate plain films for cost, et cetera, alternate a, a osseous survey with either a bone marrow MRI uh, or a CT PET without contrast and uh, every six months, something like that. Um, so it's, it, there is no guidance as to how to follow them. But, and if I saw, which we've had patients like this, if I saw that nothing is happening after a year or two, then I would ease up on that. So it, it's a little, it's a, there's an art form to this, and it's not a, it's not a validated art form of, of how to follow them. Another key thing that I didn't mention, there are many risk factors that, that aren't, potential risk factors that aren't in the uh, IMWG criteria. One of them is the cytogenetics of smoldering myeloma. So there have been studies showing that if you have DEL17 or 414, that trumps, that's just as good. You can forget the free light chains. Um, that, that will tell you if someone's going to progress or not. But again, some of those people do not. So uh, I would worry even more if someone had abnormal, had high-risk cytogenetics and smoldering multiple myeloma. I offer the patient the choice, and, and usually all of my patients complain about it. They don't, most of them, they don't like the watch and wait strategy, but they also aren't excited about uh, being treated for the rest of their lives and getting a stem cell transplant. I think going for two to five years, the op op opportunity to go for two to five years or longer off of chemotherapy is a pretty good one. Um, so that's how I look at it. Are you uh, aware of data to interpret cytogenetic evolution? So you start with low risk abnormalities and y then you add other low risk or intermediate risk abnorm abnormalities. Uh, I'm that sorry. Could you so repeat that a little so bit? So say you, 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 you start with 1114 and then you add something else that in itself is not high risk, but it's clonal evolution within the myeloma clone. Has anybody looked into the prognostic significance of that? In smoldering? Yes. No, not that I'm aware of. There may be a paper, but it's not something that's widely discussed. That's an interesting point. That would argue, though, you'd make you worry that it's, it's heading towards a progression sooner. Evolution would. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to thank Dr. Rondelli and Dr. Libby for excellent talks. For the interest of time, I would move on to the next topic. Yes. Uh, I'm going to take the, have to retake the boards this year, so I'm going to take advantage of Dr. Rondelli. Uh, sure. the <laughs> Are you sure? I'm, dr I'm dreading it. Uh, so at the myeloproliferative neoplasms, what type of routine genetic screening should, should be obtained and when you're doing the bone marrow biopsy? Well, the one I, I said before, actually, uh, there's an issue with insurance. It's not an insurance. So JAK2 uh, mutation, uh, axon 12 mutation of JAK2 uh, V16F is, is negative. Uh, MPL uh, mutation, for sure, those are the standard three. And then the, the, the epigenetic mutation, uh, there's a panel that actually is used also not only for, for MPNs, but also for MDS and, and, and AML now. Uh, there are different panels of, of uh, genes, arrays, that actually include the TEP2, IDH1 and 2, XL1 and um, uh, EHZ, and uh, there are like a, a bunch of mutations that are across the myeloid neoplasm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you have more questions, uh, you can find them at break, uh, you know, during break time you know, the, in the exhibit hall. Thank you. Thank you.